So we want to grow a food forest now, do we? Now, food forest is a low maintenance food production system based on a natural woodland and it basically works on the basis of capturing the sun's energy on multiple levels. If you think about traditional food production we create one flat space, we typically grow annual plants to produce a crop. What we're doing here is looking to nature for the solution so we're catching the sun's rays, we'll probably have large fruit and nut trees um, followed by a smaller shrub layer and smaller trees then shrubs and smaller shrubs herbaceous and perennial vegetables things like that and in between them you will have climbing plants and we will basically work with nature to produce an ecosystem and it's not just about edible plants we're also talking about medicinal herbs we're talking about fungi and creating a soil which can replenish its own nutrients and create fertility all year round. Now in this video I'm going to talk about some of the fundamentals of food forest gardening, particularly in a temperate climate. We're in a temperate climate here in the southeast of England and I'm going to show clips as I'm talking of the food forest that I'm now sitting in. Now these sorts of systems are typical of principles of things like permaculture but you know permaculture is in itself a design system which works with mother nature and ecology to create sustainable environments but the idea of a food forest does not necessarily mean that it is permaculture so Martin Crawford distinguishes between the two um, a forest garden or food forest is specifically using forest systems to produce food Many people say that permaculture cannot really be practiced in temperate climates and there's a bit of a debate on this because, you know, the typical standard for permaculture if you're going to have a food forest is all of these levels. But, you know, in a temperate climate, as Agroforestry UK points out, the sun isn't as strong. So you need a more open format to harvest that sun's energy. So you're, you're almost looking at a semi-scrubland stroke woodland but I've done what I can here it's only 300 square meters it's a much smaller system I like to think of it more as a woodland edge so you've got your hedgerow and we've got some dwarf nut trees and fruit trees mixed with other crops some low-lying fruit bushes and some perennial vegetables what nature is trying to do is get to an energy balance which usually hello which usually involves um, a forest of some kind but I mean in the UK for instance if you were just to leave a field and um, what you'd get the following year is a meadow then you would get scrub and you'd eventually end up with a woodland and what you're doing with a food forest or an agroforestry system is taking that principle and manipulating it by establishing it what species you want so you will primarily grow food Leo get down from there come on you, you'll get animals like that trying to mess up your videos in food forest human beings were put on this earth to we have the ability to manipulate nature but what we've done wrong is we've gone beyond that and we've started to annihilate nature but you know with a little bit of clever design and engineering a series of plantings and management which allows you to grow all different types of food crops which are beneficial for both man and nature. You know typically when we talk about modern agriculture what we're talking about is a monocultures of one crop which would, would never ever happen in nature. High energy input and you're just it's like a factory that's basically what it is most of our farms it's a factory system to supply to supply as much energy as possible in a small space but the problem with it is the amount of diesel energy the amount of fossil fuel energy it takes and chemical fertilizers it takes to produce that is completely unsustainable you don't even get the calories 
in terms of energy measurement out of a field of wheat that what you put in. So we're living a lie, basically. We're not, we're not going to be self-sufficient into the future. And the minute oil prices go up and up, but the minute they're, they're in a lull, but in the end, we're going to end up in a situation where we just can't feed the population as, um, that we've got. And what will happen with humans is we'll just blindly walk into it and we will just deny the facts and just a catastrophe, catastrophe will follow. Your main challenge in establishing a food forest is, is exactly that, establishing the, the system. So, you know, if you've got a field which is existing grass, you'll probably want to get your main fruit trees in first, your nut crops and your shelter layers, and then you're going to have to slowly cultivate smaller areas. Once the system's established, it shouldn't be that much hard work, but getting it to that stage can be troublesome. You know, there's going to be a lot of weeds that are going to try and take over your crops, but you'll get to a point where you you get you, you turn past the corner and you will have multi layers of different edibles and they'll be ready for you whenever you need them the food forest that i've developed here is it's only 300 square meters which is a quite large area but on the scale of forest gardens it's quite small and i like to think of this as more of a woodland edge garden something that people can implement in a smaller space um, what i have going around the edge of the property here is a hedgerow which is Cretaceous monogyna, hawthorn which which is it does have edible berries but they're very very small and I wouldn't really use that as a food crop but in a perfect world what I would like to do is start taking sections of this hedge out and planting different hedging materials that can give me more food crops but what I did here was I ended up when I first moved to this property I had five apple trees in an apple orchard and a large walnut tree and it was all lawn so I decided to make this whole area my food forest and what I decided to do was get in there the apple trees hadn't been cut for a long long time I got in and I thinned them right down so I instantly let in 50% light down to the floor I then I invested a bit of money and I bark mulched the whole thing with um, wood chippings I tried to use you know as much native wood chippings as I could and stuff that had been harvested from um, tree surgeons and I started to plant the shrub layer like things like gooseberries and ribes. I also tried to get some perennial vegetables and I started to have to grow some of them from seed and what you'll find if you go down this route is it it's a journey you know you're trying to create something some things won't work some things will work and eventually you'll get to a stage where you can just walk into the food forest and you can pretty much harvest a, a substantial amount of material for food at any one time. And the biggest thing you're gonna have to do is weed this at first. And I'm still trying to fill up this little area. I actually did a video a, a couple of years ago and it was a little tour of trying to establish it. And one guy commented on the video and he said, the main problem you're gonna have is filling these gaps up. You'll be surprised and I have to say he was absolutely right. I'm, I'm still got gaps but I'm getting to the point now where we're starting to we're starting to bulk up and it's just a matter of weeding but actually by weeding I'm harvesting. So you're always going to have things like the blackberries that are going to be a bit of a pain they're going to come in but you know as long as you do that good weed I do maybe two half days a year so it's a year it's a it's a day a year at the moment I'm, I'm doing this and what I do is I come and I weed the forest garden in June or um, late May June when that initial flush of weeds so it looks a bit awful at that time of year but then I go through and the ground is usually dry enough at that point that then weeds stay away and it fills the compost heap up and then it's just a matter of um, giving love and adding and subtracting to get the system established. Now one of the biggest elements of creating your forest garden and getting productive food crops is getting the soil fertility correct. Now, in modern agriculture, what we're effectively doing is we're plowing the ground, we're ripping up the ground, which is adding oxygen, and then we're putting in these fertilizers to add the three main elements, potassium, phosphorus, and nitrogen into the soil. Usually done with chemical fertilizers created from oil, effectively crude oil, basically. But, you know, in nature, what you're looking to do is establish a soil ecology. Now there was a really good permaculture 
documentary in the UK that the BBC um, did and what they saw there was a bit of film footage from the 1950s when a lady's farm was being ploughed and you had hundreds of seagulls and birds coming down and following the tractor and they, they actually showed a bit of footage from the year before which I think was 2017 and there were no birds. So these birds that were feeding on the worms and the bugs in the soil now had, there was nothing. And the reason for that was is that the soil over these decades has become so degraded in soil life, effectively now the soil is almost dead. So the only way you can really work with nature is to build up that natural soil, which really only comes from death and decay and recycling nutrients. And mainly a lot of that is catalyzed by fungus and soil life. So you've really got to work with ecology if you want to establish your food forest system. You know what I try and do is I, when I do landscape projects, I rip out old shrubs and I just get the root, the root sort of masses of the plant and the trunk and I lay them into the ground. And they actually look like quite aesthetic features in the landscape. Just trying to create as many places for wildlife and bugs and mini beasts to, to live, to shelter and to let the organic matter degrade back into the soil. Now by having wildlife and birds around your forest garden, what you're gonna do is you're gonna allow nutrients in the form of droppings to get back into the soil. Also, what you will wanna do is put some pioneer type plants like comfrey in your garden. Now, comfrey will penetrate the soil really deep down, you know, up to five meters into the ground, penetrate that cap layer in the soil get down to that real sub bedrock of the soil and it will bring up a lot of minerals from the ground and it will bring that out into its foliage and what you usually will do and that's why I mean comfrey was used as a fertilizer for many years you can still use it as a fertilizer in the garden you chop it down um, and you can just use it as a mulch and that will de decompose into the soil and over time you will build this fertility back into the soil and what I do is I have another system with my chickens and I have a rough kind of compost every time I plant something here I would put some of that rough compost around inside the mulch and the mulch itself will by, will degrade and you will eventually end up with over time a, um, a reoccurrence of nutrients into the ground and I've certainly seen that here I'm putting things in the ground in the early days that just would just not not do, do very well now it's getting to the point I'm putting things in even annuals, I like to put dot some sunflowers around every summer just for some height and some, some blooms and you know they're taking off just beautifully and if you scratch at the ground now it's actually got a composty look to it which is quite amazing seeing when I started it was just a, a chalk bedrock with just a thin layer of soil. So a typical sort of setup for maybe a temperate permaculture system or a food forest in a temperate climate would be you know maybe a few nut trees nuts are really good because they are very high in energy when they crop and they're storable i think per acre sweet chestnuts things like that walnuts you can get just as much tonnage of carbohydrate per acre as you can a wheat field what you'll be looking to do is interdisperse these with some fruit trees things like that you don't really want a glut of anything i've got five apple trees it's not always the best option um, so you want to diversify. Here I planted some extra plum trees, some lower growing nuts, I planted some cob nuts and I've basically bonsified them. I've put them in a planted box so that they've become more of a shrub and they give me a nut crop. You'll then want things like artichokes, cardoons, things that can you know penetrate the ground with a long tap root even in a drought ridden area and give you a sort of um, a vegetable crop. Um, things like Good King Henry I have here, I have um, Babington's leek, which is really, really hardy leek. It's not as thick as a normal leek, but it will sow freely and it will spread. And, you know, they're really good, actually, the Babington's leek, because you can come along in spring when nothing else is really growing and just chop them down. One of the things I would do if you want to create an edible food forest is use plants that you want to eat, you know. I mean... This doesn't apply to food for me, but lemon balm. We always, me and my wife, we always used to have a bedtime drink. We used to drink Ovaltine. I know in the UK it's quite popular. Until I discovered lemon balm, it grows absolutely anywhere, and I've got 
loads of it here now and it is one thing that I use and I will get two main crops of this year. It grows, it's like a mint, part of the mint family, grows up every year, I chop it down, dry that, I get a second crop in the autumn and I chop that and I dry it and basically it gives you an amazing stress relief bedtime tea and it just tastes really good as well and I have that every year. So, you know, even if it's not necessarily a food crop, just plants that you're going to use, you know, and there's so many. I mean, I have tarragon over there. I have thyme along the front edge where there's a lot of sun. You know, there's also a lot of plants I put here which are just beneficial for fixing nitrogen. What I was doing in the early days is just getting some of the dwarf broad beans and I was just going around putting a spade in, putting a few in, and you know, they wouldn't grow as well as you would in the ground, but I was using them effectively as a green manure. You'd get this low bush forming you'd get a crop out of it, you could chop the tops off of the broad beans and use that in stir fries. And you'd look out onto the woodland garden, the food forest, and you'd think there wasn't much going on, but you'd, you'd take a bowl and it'd be absolutely full with greens. That's the power of deception, you know, overlooking over a large area. And that's what's so good about food forests. You've really got the potential to maximize your food growing. Herbs, I've got low bear, I've actually got some, um, some gooseberries here. Um, quite a substantial amount of food. And, Another thing, another route you can go down is fungi. If you inoculate stumps and inoculate sections of cut tree, I went round to a tree surgeon, I knew they were cutting down a big oak, and I took some sections of oak and I bought the inoculated wooden dowels, and you drill holes into the log and you tap them in, and you basically leave them in a sh shady, humid corner and they will fruit with edible mushrooms. I had um, a good log that was giving me a lot of shiitake mushrooms. The most successful ones I had was the oyster mushrooms. They're a little bit more easier to grow. I grew them on poplar logs. And what I actually found was the, the mycelium actually spread down into the wood chips and I started to get a crop of oyster mushrooms on the ground. You have to research what you're doing with fungi, you have to know what you're doing, but it's worth experimenting. You know, fungi and mycelium is a weird and wonderful world. Some things won't take, some things will naturally occur there, you'll be very lucky to have them. So that really comes with knowledge. Uh, to be honest, a lot of edible food forest is about knowledge. It's about walking around a system, knowing what's available when, very much like great apes do in their environment. And you know, they are our closest living relatives and that's what makes edible food forests so exciting for me. It's really what we need to do as animals, because we are animals, you know, and that, that's how we're supposed to live. And um, there was a documentary on last night with Chris Packham in the UK, um, Spring Watch, and he was talking about the science now of people just walking in the woods during the lockdown period that we've had. Um, and the amount of science now that they've got the proof that, 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 that being around trees is so good for you. You know, these monoculture landscapes with all this high energy agriculture, yeah, it might serve the industrialized systems of the world and keep us moving, but it's not actually, it's, it's actually completely wrong. You know, if you want to get down to ethics, ethically, it's um, an absolute disgrace how we're carrying on, you know. So really what way we have to move is to more perma permanent systems. And that, you know, that leads me on to the fact that I, I am somebody personally that should not really, I, I, get, I just don't like towns, I don't like cities, I don't like these high density environments. I don't think we're supposed to live like that and I think that it generally adds to people's anxiety and stress in life. Even if they're subconscious, even if it's subconscious, the noise, the hustle, the pollution, you know, I mean, I used to live in London. I moved out to the country and it was like a light bulb going off in my head. And I always loved going out and walking in the woods. But now I pretty much immerse myself in what I do here in the nature garden. I will sit there sometimes by a campfire, I have a little campfire system set up in the woodland garden. And this is what you're supposed to do as well. Edible food forests are supposed to be places to come and enjoy nature as well. Watch the birds, watch the insects. <clears throat> You know, go out with your children and, and, and look at the insects and, and learn about nature and learn about the symbiosis of yourself and nature. That's what it should be about. You know, I sometimes what I do here is I come out into the food forest and I just sit there and I get that period of time when the sun's low in the sky and I just sit there quietly until it's pitch black. And I cannot leave there until it's pitch black. You will have some of the most amazing encounters you never thought were even possible when you do that. 
um, there is something that happens during that time of the day it just reaches a spiritual chord in the soul and unless you've done it you won't know so you know that's another great thing about edible food forests it's it's about tapping in to that wild energy that most people unfortunately have lost you know when you're establishing your food forest you're going to have to take note of the sun's light it's all about harvesting the sun's energy what i've done over here there's an apple tree that looks like it's eventually going to die in the next few years it's not very productive anymore I've planted a mulberry tree there. You know, with food forest, you've always got to think five years in front, 10 years in front. So when that apple tree is starting to die, I want something there a little way from it by the hedgerow that's going to spring up. And I've planted a mulberry tree. Mulberry tree, you can actually eat the leaves, the young leaves, and you can have that fruit as well. So this is what you're trying to do. You're trying to look at a space and construct it in your mind and work with the seasons and and, and, and have this vision and develop it as you go. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a thing where you, where you do a bit of work one year and you get a result. Um, like we want things to be in life, you've got to develop things over time. Now, my business, I do a lot of landscaping and what I do is I get a lot of the soft waste, any green waste, any shrub stuff, some delicate twiggy sort of stuff and I pile that into the corner of the woodland for food forest every year. And after about a year, you can go in and you can smash that down. The bigger stuff you can chip. Um, using wood chippers is less sustainable because you're using energy, but it is a quicker way of getting to where you need to go. But I smash that stuff up into a sort of twiggy hay and I spread that around and that's really good as well. That's just as good as a bark mulch. It's a bit of a longer system. You have to wait for it to dry and become brittle to sort of smash it down, walk over it and, and then spread that around the system. So you always want to be adding new woody material at first to mulch and keep suppress the weeds and allow that soil life to start to develop. So, you know, really in the early days of establishing a food forest, that ecological balance will allow you to minimize slugs. In my food forest, I have hostas and people always comment when they come in, you've got the, the hugest, beautifulest hostas. And they said, why, why don't the slugs eat the hostas? And I always point out to them, when I leave for work in the morning, I'll usually just open the door and look and you have got so many birds in the lower branches of the trees. And this gives them security. They sort of come down, they hop along, they're, they're taking the slugs and the snails, they're controlling the pests. And what you've effectively got there is um, wild pest control. Nothing can get to them hostas because they are under con constant a bombardment from from the birds because they have this low-lying vegetation that makes it very easy for them and they feel secure to come down and take the pests. I actually have normal vegetable borders over there and I have the same thing. I have fruit trees around the back of the borders and I never have a problem with slugs. And even my wife says, you've got rows of lettuces and never get eaten by slugs. Quite simply, look out in the morning, six in the morning or in the afternoon when it's getting dark, what do you see? You see birds dropping down from them trees. And even though we've got cats, and they are troublesome cats for birds, the cats can't get to the birds because the birds have got such low branches, they can see, they've got, they, they, they feel comfortable enough to come and take them. We've very rarely do the cats actually get one of the birds because the birds can see, they have a good spectrum of view. So that's something you've got to think about as well. It is about working with nature. And there's nothing wrong with adding some habitat boosters. I've got bat boxes in the walnut tree and I have some hedgehog homes that I've built. It's all about giving nature what it needs to do what it can to help you. And you know, you're helping nature and nature will help you. You know, you mess with nature and it's going to come and bite you in the backside. So basically, to sum up really, to establish your food forest, there's so much information out there. I would, I've tried in this video to just show you some clips of what I'm doing here on a very small level. It's still developing. I've included a lot of things, flowers, you know, to make it look more beautiful, but actually things that will either like the lupins are a beautiful flower, but they actually add nitrogen to the soil. So now they've finished flowering, I'll cut them to the ground. That will become a mulch. The digitalis, something which naturally occurs in the forests nearby, the bees absolutely love it. It adds a bit of beauty to the garden. Um, and like I say, it should also be a beautiful place and it will become a beautiful place. I remember when I first moved to this property and this was just all grass that I had to mow. 
I mean, look at me now. I'm sitting here, I'm completely covered by vegetation. You know, I've got a small dwarf chestnut behind me. I've got, I've got globe artichokes. I've got fruit bushes. I've got edible herbs all around me. It's a lot of fun and you will be amazed. In the morning, I looked out the window, there was a huge roe deer in here. Now, I know roe deer are not perfect because they all graze things. I don't really mind that at the minute because there's so much food in this forest, it just doesn't affect me. And they only sort of take the tops off anyway of some things, which actually help most of my plants to divide even more. But the wildlife and the, the sense of peace you get in edible food forests is just immense. So, you know, that's another thing I've mentioned. Just try and go out there during the night. Just, just promise me, if you've watched this video to the end, you're gonna go out, you're gonna sit in a forest somewhere, if it's not your own edible food forest, and wait for the sun to come down. You cannot move until it's pitch black. And you will experience something not many people get to experience. And that is also the beauty of food forests. I have a little campfire system, I cook them. Think about it, you know, we've been on the earth for what they reckon about 100, Cro-Magnon man, about 100,000 years. I mean, obviously before that we were evolving. But for tens of thousands of years, we have sat every night by a campfire. We've done it for thousands of years. And all of a sudden in this tiny micro piece of our history, we're now sitting on a backside watching TV. You know, we only got to be a so-called successful species in the blink of an eye so let's tap into what we were doing before every now and then and I think food forests give us that ability be it on a very basic level so there you have it edible food forests there's a whole range of ways you can go about it they're a fantastically beautiful environment to be in they're good for wildlife and they put a little bit of dinner on the table as well food forests get out there and grow one. Now remember, if you like the videos and you want to see more of this long form type of content about self-sufficiency, permaculture, forest gardens, and how to survive the apocalypse, please press that like button and please share and subscribe to the channel. It means a hell of a lot to me and I would really, really like to go a bit more in depth into some of the things I'm working on here um, so I can show you guys more stuff and you can comment and, and teach me and put me right where I go wrong. All right, thank you very much.